Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Becky Robinson. I'm so glad to be here today with my friend and client, John Baldoni. Hi, John. How are you today? I'm doing great, Becky. We're going to have fun today. Thanks for inviting me to the show today. So. Uh, of course. And I've you know, I've noticed that a lot of people are already entering into the Zoom room, and we would love to invite you to take a moment to tell us in the chat where you are calling in from today. And if you happen to be participating in this webinar as part of your professional development, we would also love to know what organization you represent, and I can give you a shout out. Um, as we get rolling. So as we get started, um, I will let you know that we are recording today's event and today's event will be available to you later to share with colleagues or to rewatch. Um, and let me just take a moment to shout out some of the folks who are with us today. We do have a caller in Stockholm, Sweden. Welcome. Uh, welcome to Chip in Lake Oconee, Georgia. Uh, welcome in Toronto, Canada, Atlanta, Georgia, Texas, uh, Croatia, Chicago, Illinois. Hi, Howard. I know you. Uh, hi to Rob, my friend in North Carolina, Christine in Central Florida, uh, Daryl in Charlotte. Uh, welcome in Indianapolis, Dallas. Another, uh, someone else is in Ann Arbor, Michigan today, John. So welcome to you, Bill. Well, it's a good friend of mine, Bill, and uh, he's actually in Florida right now, but that's okay. Oh, <laughs> well, we uh, we have Mike Neese on the call today. Mike, it's good to see you again. Um, so thanks to all of you who are joining us today. It is sure to be a rich time of learning. A side note that we are uh, we do have available closed captioning for you today. So in the event that that would add to your enjoyment and learning on today's event, we would encourage you to go ahead and use that closed captioning that we have available for you. All right, so as we get started, I wanna take a moment to introduce John um, and to show you his beautiful new book, Grace Under Pressure. Uh, John Baldoni is the author of 16 best-selling books and his books have been translated into over 10 10 languages and counting. Um, and there are actually three books in what John calls the Grace Trilogy. So this is the third one, Grace Under Pressure, Leading Through Change and Crisis. There's also Grace, A Leader's Guide to a Better Us, and Grace Notes, Leading in an Upside Down World. So um, after you learn about Grace Under Pressure, I bet you're gonna wanna actually get all three books in the Grace Trilogy. At the moment, we are awaiting news from Post Hill Press about the exact launch date of this book, but it is coming in late April. And so today would be the perfect time to pre-order and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, a few more things about John. John is an internationally recognized keynote speaker. He's been on lots of stages. He presents at lots of virtual events. He's also an outstanding executive coach. And Thinkers360 named John the number one thought leader in coaching in 2023. And they also named him as a top 10 thought leader for both leadership and management in 2022. So every time I'm with John, it's an opportunity to learn more. And uh, I know that you are going uh, to adore this opportunity to learn with him too. All right, so John, let's dive right in. Um, I would love to hear you uh, define what you mean by grace under pressure. Well, grace is uh, under pressure is a phrase that uh, Hemingway uh, used in a letter to um, Dorothy Parker, who was a uh, New Yorker writer, among many things, and they were friends. Um, John Kennedy, actually Ted Sorensen, who wrote uh, most of uh, Profiles in Courage, found the phrase and wanted to use it. And, and so Grace Under Pressure, as Hemingway defined it, was in our parlance, keeping cool when the heat's on. So acting and courage under fire. Certainly John Kennedy lived that uh, both, uh, certainly he was a, a war hero in Second World War I, excuse me, World War II in the South Pacific when his uh, PT-109 uh, was sunk uh, and he swam out in shark infested waters for three or four days in a row to flag down a, uh, a ship because his uh, crew was marooned on an isolated island. And also he dealt with many uh, challenges, physical ailments throughout his life. Um, so grace under pressure is that ability to, to keep it cool, keep it real when the heat's on. And um, the title comes from a good friend of mine, C.B. Bowman. I was talking about giving muscle to grace. And she said, how about grace under pressure? 
And this is my third book, as you mentioned. And grace is that I define it as the catalyst for the greater good. Uh, it is a way of connecting with others. And so, uh, but when you put it in an organizational framework, and when we're under stress, as we are right now, um, challenges are very hard. Uh, it's up to leaders to bring people together for common cause. And that's not always easy when the heat's on. And so, but the best leaders are those who know how to act uh, cool, calm, and collected. They may not uh, man up, be feeling that inside, but they project that. And that's what the organization needs. You know, in my show, Grace Under Pressure, which I do on LinkedIn, I've interviewed a few special forces folks and I um, their training, um, is, they do stress training. And, uh, and, uh, and so when they get into conflict situations, they've in a way been there before, they will still feel fear, but they manifest this sense of calmness. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what we want, because when we see our leaders losing it and acting um, frightened, we lose confidence. Uh, and so grace under pressure is very important. So the book is focused on three things. Uh, what do leaders do when the heat's on? Well, one, they take care of their people. Two, they take care of themselves. And three, they prepare for the future. And the challenge I faced in this book was those things are not rocket science. Every leader preaches that stuff. Um, but do it with a sense of, of grace. And, and in this sense, what is grace? Well, mm -hmm. it's kindness. It's compassion. It's generosity. And it's courage. And so, and it, what you do is you you're you're creating a community where people feel they belong. So, in a nutshell, that's what this book explores. So, John, uh, let's you know dive a little deeper on why it's such a critical aspect. So, not that many leaders or leadership experts use that word grace. So, tell me why it was so critical to you to bring that word into wider conversations. I, you and I had talked about, you know, sometimes people think of all grace right. as a religious word, and you are not using it in a religious sense at all. So, uh, why the word grace? Why is it so critical to you? Well, I'm glad. I've been reading about, I've been researching and reading grace for years, and actually writing about it a little, a little bit. And what intrigues me about it is how people cope. How people deal with moments of stress. Um, and so what I want to do, and that's so important in our times today, because as I said in my um, second book of Grace, uh, about we're leading or leading in an upside down world. Everything's been changed. And so how do we deal with these things? How do we um, come together? How do we focus ourselves? And people, grace is a concept that people, they hear it, and almost a smile comes to their face. They may not know exactly what it means. And to be honest with you, I've stretched its definition um, in a way. But I wanted to get the idea, if it's the human connection. It's the people-to-people -people, uh, thing. And it's also that, and in this book, is the, a sense of community. And when I say community, I like to think of the workplace as aspiring to be a community. And we know we've been in workplaces where that um, uh, uh, colleague, uh, Amy Edmondson, talks about the word psychological safety, where people feel that essentially they belong, they can voice their ideas. That doesn't mean everybody thinks nor acts alike, nor should they, but they come together for a common cause. They know the vision, mission, and values of the organization. They buy into it. And that's a kind of community. It's a belonging, and we're all looking for belonging. And you mentioned something else. There's an epidemic of loneliness in our society today. Community is the antidote to that. Grace is the facilitates community, engagement, connection. Hmm. Well, so let's talk a little bit more about ways that you see grace show up in the workplace. So what are some things that a leader is doing when they demonstrate grace under pressure? They demonstrate a sense of understanding and that they care. We use the word a lot, empathy. Empathy is that ability to feel someone else's 
discomfort or even their joy. We never talk about the positive side of empathy, which is feeling someone's uh, uh, good things that they experience. That's a first step for a leader. You have to express that empathy. And that's where compassion comes in. And compassion is the co rooted in the commitment to others, a promising, a passion for people, a passion for ideas, a passion for wanting to make positive things happen and bring people together. Thank you for that, John. So I have some comments in the chat. Uh, we have um, Marcus is sharing that stress is energy to face a challenge, or he reminds himself that stress is energy to face a challenge. And Mark says he increasingly uses breathing in moments of stress. We do have a question for our audience. Um, we would love to hear if you would share in the chat about a time that you've received grace or a time when you've shown grace. And John, I'm wondering if you could share with us, what's a time in the workplace that you've experienced grace from someone else? My entire life has been blessed with grace from childhood to probably this very moment with you. And I truly mean that. Um, I have received far more than I've ever given. Whenever someone is kind to me, um, when they cut me a break, when I make a mistake, which is more often than I want to admit. And it's, it's showing that compassion, not overreacting when I overreact keeping it together, kindness. So for me, grace can be, and I've on my show, I've done almost more than a 200 uh, episodes now. And on each one, the one requirement is you have to share a story of grace. And I've, the stories that I hear are simple and, and, and transactional, as well as transformative. So, um, and, um, uh, and so that's where grace comes in. And, um, we have, uh, I know Chip Bell is tuning in and listening today, and he told me a wonderful story about grace in his life, um, as a young officer serving in South Vietnam and during the, the war. So that's, you know, grace touches us in many, many different ways. So. So there's a note here from Rob who says that assuming positive intent is a great way to show grace to others, but it's not always easy. Um, and Joshua says uh, he loves that you're mentioning the small moments that we give and receive grace every day rather than just the big moments. Grace is key to every healthy culture. So please keep sharing your stories of grace in the chat. We would love to see those. John will have a chance to read through the chat later. Well, I want to pick up on something. I'm, I'm glad that the gentleman just said that about uh, what that comes down to is respect and show, treating. But there was a previous thing about showing grace to oneself. Um, leaders are lousy at that <laughs> because they don't have time. Um, and they're so, in, in the positive sense, they're outward directed. So they short themselves. And as that previous caller said, self-care is so important. Breathing, um, reflecting, taking a moment and understanding where you are, being mindful, both as a practice and in the moment is a form of self-care, self-grace. So. Hmm. so here's a note from Sherry. She says, my role changed in July due to a restructuring. I met with my new leader and asked what he wanted me to focus on. His response, refresh on survivor's guilt and feel your feelings. It will help you in the coming days and weeks. And it sounds like, um, Sherry, that you experienced that as grace from that new leader. So John, um, would you be willing to share with us a time when you've seen a leader show grace to you? Show grace to me. I, mm -hmm. um, uh, you said your whole life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think an, an example of I've had opportunities with a client where I may have fallen short of the mark and the client has given me the opportunity to rectify it and do it better. Um, mm -hmm. That's the type of thing. Or I remember once um, there was a client, I had this is a, a business situation where the client pulled the plug on a project but paid us in full. So that's a moment of grace. Not not significant. I mean, it was. I'm very grateful for that, of course. But that's that. But then, the, on a greater sense, the grace I had from my parents, both setting me the great example, uh, teaching me. I'm also Jesuit educated, uh, which is accounts for my my aspiration for goodness, but also <laughs> doesn't cover up all my flaws. They taught me grace, um, mm -hmm. what it means to serve others, and how to orient one's life towards service 
as a way of purpose and meaning. So that's what I, it's the teachings that have enabled me. Amazing. So here's a note from um, Mike Neese. He says, I believe grace is a catalyst and symptom of community. He remembers when Herman Miller did the first ever layoff, how difficult it was to see family members in that organization have to leave. And the CEO insisted that grace be a guiding principle of that sad separation. Um, uh, we often see that in, in times of stress or layoff. It's how an organization does it, how they communicate what services they provide, uh, not firing people over email, um, <laughs> which sadly has become the norm. That's acting ungracefully. Um, but uh, companies often have to make tough decisions. It's how they do it that well, people don't want to be laid off, of course, but when they're treated with respect. And that's part of, I think that's fundamental to grace is it's that catalyst for the good, but looking at others uh, as human beings, and we're all human, and we all have emotions, we all have feelings, and when we're adults, we have responsibilities, understanding that when you need to make those decisions. And what we call that is acting with compassion. Mm -hmm. so. so John, you reference the importance of self-care, and that we need to show grace to ourselves when we're leading, and what that looks like. Why do you think it's so much easier to show grace to others than it is to show grace to ourselves. I think it's conditioning. I think that leaders are very outward directed, uh, most of all, and they just they get caught up in it. It's part of a lack of self awareness that all many of us suffer from, or um, um, all of us. So that's part of the situation too. So, and it's also maybe I don't feel so important. Fortunately, um, uh, the, if, if COVID or the pandemic has taught us one thing, it's the importance of self-care. And there's a lot of in the book about the topic of resilience. And you can't be resilient unless you learn how to turn it off. If you don't turn it off, which leaders are on, on stage, acting most of the time, um, that suffers burnout. And uh, I quote uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Sharon Melnick uh, extensively throughout the book on her lessons for resilience, personal, uh, which all comes down to self-care. But I think now it's become more fashion excuse, acceptable to talk about my personal limitations. And maybe that's the other part of it, um, why we don't do self-care. It's like, oh, what's wrong with you, uh, Becky? Why do you need to take time off, you know? And I'll be honest with you, I think women are far better at doing that than we men, because we're, uh, you know, we have that uh, testosterone cur cursing through us. And as a friend of mine often says, that can be a poison. <laughs> so uh, we learn, we men need to back off too. So, so a couple notes from people in the chat. Um... Chip, our friend, says, while grace is often used as unconditional acceptance, the source of that is love. So leaders with grace also demonstrate a kind of love for others, deep caring and compassion, as in with passion. Um, Carrie is noting, I work at a community college and have seen and received countless moments of grace, professors allowing students to turn in late assignments that normally wouldn't have, administrators allowing staff to adjust their work hours to address family needs, et cetera. So that's a really powerful demonstration of grace. Um, uh, love is essential. I'm, and, and thanks to Chip for mentioning that. And we kind of shy away from using the word love. I mean, we're comfortable uh, in our personal relationships using it, um, but we kind of shy away from it when we're in a community environment. And um, my friend Chester Elton gives a wonderful talk about gratitude and expressing love. And he and he makes a joke about you, you tell your spouse you love her, but when you go into the office, you have to phrase it a little differently. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so, but it's but it's this, the emotion is there, the caring for others. That's how you express it. It's not so much much what you say, it's how you act, being considerate, and some so often being considerate is simply a matter of you know what listening. Even when you think you know what the other person is going to say, or you know what they're going to say, because you've heard it a hundred times, owe them the sense of patience and the respect. Listen. So mm. that's grace. Yeah, that's powerful. 
Um, so John, is there anything else you want to say about that link between empathy and compassion that you've referenced a few times in our conversation so far? Well, empathy, empathy is where it starts and compassion is the expression of it. And it manifests itself in actions. What are we going to do? A compassionate leader is not being. A compassionate leader is doing. Hmm. Well, you know what shows up for me as you say that, John, is how we deal with mistakes. And Carrie was talking about, you know, late assignments in the university setting. So if a leader is leading with grace under pressure and demonstrating that empathy and compassion, then what does it look like when a massive mistake is discovered? Well, you um, do a debrief and you find out what happened, but you listen. And then at the end, you if this is correctable, you give that give the uh, person the opportunity to correct it, um, but and guidance. And this is and, and under it's putting it in perspective. What happened and why? Now, if these are transgressions that hurt people, um, talking about harassment and assault, that's a different matter. You know, that's outside the realm of this. But we all make mistakes and giving people the chance to correct it, but also giving them the tools and the support to do so. The other thing is grace is not always a free pass. So, for example, if you if I'm working for you, Becky, and I keep making the same mistake over and over again, you know, I'm probably not the right person to be working with you. So there is a strength in there. So maybe we have to have a parting of the ways, but you do it respectfully and you do it with a sense of uh, res uh of dignity giving the person dignity dignity is fundamental to grace i am looking at a human being and the work they do the work i would like to regard it as the dignity of work the dignity of contribution the dignity of working for all of us together on the mission um and then if we have to have a party in the ways do it with respect for what they've done. That makes sense. So it's not the time to, you know, degrade someone or devalue them, but to recognize their value as a human, even if working together isn't the right path forward. And there's the other part of that, which is, of course, and when you keep coddling underperformers who do not change, what you're you're sending the wrong signal to the rest of the team. They will become irritated and their productivity, their level of engagement, they'll go, well, Becky's getting away with being a deadbeat. Why am I killing myself? So that's where the grace comes in. I'm looking for the greater good to help the team succeed. So. A uh, cool note uh, from Mike here. I think of grace as forgiveness on steroids, and it's easier to be compassionate and, care, compassionate and caring to those we treasure. It's more difficult uh, when someone hmm, has done the leader or the organization wrong. So um, let, let's talk again about this idea of resilience, John, and the interconnectedness of grace and resilience. Um, how do we How do we see those two as working together? Well, it's a great thought. And I think uh, Eileen uh, McDarg has taught us that resilience has that ability to spring forward, bend back, but you come into a new environment. And if you've paid attention, you are transformed. So look at grace as that opportunity to open your mind to be um, less uh, like uh, things are, I let go of the past so that you can grow into the future. I would consider that a form of grace. But from a wider standpoint, um, and this is what we learned from our folks in the first responders, be they special forces, be they here at home, all the um, uh, folks who take care of us, um, our <clears throat> hospitals, uh, physicians, aides, the whole nurses, they have a sense of resilience and they teach it, okay? By First of all, they teach it by example, by living what it means to be resilient, but also sharing the lessons so other people can think, ah, this is how I act. This is how I should do it. I lost it here, but here's what I'll do the next time. So there's grace in that. Grace comes, you know, as a teaching is a form of grace. You're sharing your knowledge, how you do it. And um, being open to questions, uh, listening to the learner, that's a form of grace, too. So grace is that 
facilitator that allows good things to happen. So. Yeah, I love that. So, uh, John, for those who might be listening, I'm wondering if you could share two practical ways that leaders can start to demonstrate grace under pressure. One is macro, adopt the big picture. What's going on here? What is happening? Uh, and how does that lead into the greater scheme? So we've made a mistake we're here, or there's a new challenge there. Um, how do we deal with it? What are the long-term implications? That's macro. Micro is the person-to-person. -person. Looking at your team and saying, hey, um, change is coming. How are we going to deal with it? I respect you. I need you. And I want all of us to work together. And I need us to cooperate with one another. I need us to show kindness to one another. And I want us to collaborate, to share, um, and to work together. So macro is the big picture. Micro is the person to person. That seems like a really good framework for a leader. If you are if you want to think about on a daily basis, how do I behave with grace under pressure? macro, big picture, what's my organization experiencing? How can I demonstrate grace when it's difficult? And then in each individual interaction, micro, uh, that's that's a really powerful way of looking at it. And and, and it's drill down a little further. It gets back to what your had, uh, previous um, caller had said. There's a saying in the military, um, when the heat's on, the commander's voice gets slower and deeper. Uh, because it's acting in a more composed fashion. So you don't fly off the handle. You listen, you slow it down. Um, I once worked with a leader who was in the field and um, he was an IT professional and there was a massive outage. So he would call all his team together, explain the situation calmly, had, and then here, here's how we're going to do it kept convening, you know, hour by hour, then day by day, the whole thing, but maintain that cool demeanor, that collectiveness, and the fact that we're all in this together. And here's a great story. I interviewed Julia Burstein from, um, who wrote, uh, she's with CNBC, a reporter for them, and she wrote a wonderful book called When Women Lead. And she said, her research said that during the lockdown, it was women executives really rose to the fore in bringing their people together. You know why? Because they weren't afraid to ask for help. <laughs> and so, whereas some male leaders were, this gets back to why we are resistant to this type of thing, were a little res resilient, excuse me, reluctant to ask for help as a means of showing um weakness. And that gets into the whole sense of vulnerability and humility. Humility, I used to joke all the time that humility is one thing they don't teach at business school. Um, actually, I think a lot of schools, they do teach it, but uh, which is good. So my joke doesn't work, but the practice is there. Humility is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength and as an acknowledgement that I don't have all the answers, but let's figure it out together. And humility is also the Ability to seek help when you need it. And as we had talked earlier about it, with mental health becoming uh, more of a recognized issue, people can be more uh, um, encouraged to seek it, especially when the leaders do. And it's this interesting story from it happened in, um, in, in Iraq when some of the senior officers were saying, I have PTSD, I'm getting help. That gave permission for the troops in their command to do the same. So when a leader is acknowledging, hey, I need help on this thing, it sends a positive signal um, to, to others. Yeah, that's really powerful. So leaders acknowledging that they need help can be a form of grace that opens the door for others to admit that they need help as well. Right. Really powerful. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what a leader can do to demonstrate grace under pressure when their plans fail. Like how, you know, faced with failure, how can a leader uh, respond with grace under pressure? Well, I think you do what what I taught. You convene people and you do a diagnostic. What happened? What? And here, when plans 
fail. It's not unusual for plants to fail. I think in many ways, all plants fail. It's not the, but we get the results and we can get better results or we get um, uh, poor outcomes. But diagnose, diagnosing what happened, um, who's responsible for doing what? As the leader, you're responsible for everything. You didn't have the right people in place or you didn't give them the right resources or whatever it is. Um, a good friend of mine who's a retired army general said, it's always the commander's fault. <laughs> so uh, whether they acknowledge it or not. So it's dealing with it. And failure is part of life. You know, there's a wonderful story I've wrote in, uh, uh, in a previous book, and I got it from a, uh, a mentor to me, Michael Yusim, who teaches at Wharton. And he talked about Charles L. Lockey, um, who uh, uh, ran JPL, <laughs> Chapter Paulson Laboratory, that did the deep, still does the deep space thing. And they had two back-to-back -back missions, uh, our spacecraft slammed into um, uh, Mars. By slammed, I mean they crashed. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the project managers from both of them, uh, the, the um, projects came into Alaki's office with their resignations. And he looked at him, Alaki looked at him, sat back and said, gentlemen, why would I fire you after I spent $10 million educating you go figure it out and come back <laughs> you know mm. that's what you do that's showing grace that's an example of learning from failure and it's how you do it you know i mean he could have kept them on but berated them but he didn't he expressed hope in them had he berated them or only then they would have been less motivated. They would have lost their sense of confidence and they wouldn't have been able, a leader without confidence ain't going anywhere because people sense that in a heartbeat. And confidence is essential to leadership. Too much uh, is toxic, but a, a amount of confidence is, in, uh, is essential to um, inspiring belief um, uh, in your ability to get things done. Very powerful. So we want to take a moment, uh, John, to let people know a bit more about the book and what's coming. And there was actually a question in the chat about the book that I'm going to ask you in just a second. Um, but what we want to do right now is uh, let people know about some special opportunities related to the book. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, okay, so we are hoping that as you're enjoying the content and getting a glimpse of what's inside of Grace Under Pressure, that you will pre-order a copy of the book for yourself or uh, your team or a friend or colleague. And there are some special premiums for those who would order Grace Under Pressure in bulk, including access to um, the handbook of John's online course on the same topic. Um, the other thing is that for those of you who are here today, uh, we have the opportunity for you to get a free 20 minute coaching call with John. Um, executive coaching is the work that he does uh, and is recognized as a thought leader for. If you're looking for a new executive coach, we hope that you'll sign up to try out a free 20 minute coaching call with John. We'd also love to encourage you to invite John to speak at your next event on this important topic. So now to the question that we had from an attendee, uh, Howard was wondering about um, the book's structure. So how is the book structured? Is it stories, models, analogies, and how can we best use it? It's all of the above. <laughs> the tri it's a tripart, well, actually four-part uh, structure. Um, part one, taking care of the team. T two is taking care of yourself. Three is preparing for the future. And four are active examples of leading with grace and, and courage and compassion. Um, there's also a little handbook and the book itself. There's also the online version, but there's also the handbook itself, uh, which has some exercises that you can do. At the end of virtually every chapter, there are what I call considerations, which are think about questions that you can ask yourself. There's also a self-assessment at the end of the book. You can test your powers of grace if you want and what you can work on. Yeah, so. Perfect. Well, so we have and a yes, really- there's, there's plenty of story, and, and to Howard's point, there are plenty of stories. So. 
Well, so um, now's the time that we want to open up for Q&A from all of you. And it looks like we already have some people putting questions in the chat. So I'm going to start with the one that I see here from Tina. Um, and please feel free to add your questions as well. We'll get to as many as we can today. So Tina is asking, what advice can you give to handle other leader colleagues that tend to inappropriately react in times of stress? Well, it depends on what your role is. <laughs> if you're their boss, then I would have a one-to-one -one conversation with them um, and saying, you know, I've noticed that you're acting, uh, you know, you're losing your temper, you're losing your cool. Um, why is that? And do you know the effect you're having on others? And sometimes when people, they're not even aware of it, you know, um, and what, and, and demonstrating that when they continue to act inappropriately or lose it, whatever, they lose their, they're losing the one thing they have from others. And that's respect me. I mean, if you're, somebody's always losing it, we don't, we lose respect. We don't want to work with them anymore. So they're losing their effectiveness. Now that's, if you're the boss as a colleague, be careful. Um, just say, you know, uh, Hey, can I tell you something? It depends on what your relationship is. Uh, if they're uh, um, if 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 you have a trusting relationship with them, you just say, you know, I've noticed something. Um, you know, when something happens, you kind of lose it. What's going on? You know, and and then you know that and just say, you know, uh, if uh, Becky, that's really not helping you. You know, and she'll go, what do you mean? I go, well, you know, I, people just turn off. They have you noticed they don't listen to you anymore? <laughs> that that type of thing. So. I think play out the implication of what the negative behavior is, that they're undermining their ability to do their job. Thank you for that, uh, John. So it sounds like try to have a curious conversation and uh, share what, what you're noticing. So Absolutely, Cynthia is yeah. wondering, is there such a thing as withholding or not giving grace? And what does that look like? That, that's my part. I added that part. <laughs> well, I think we live in a society that withholds grace um, only every day. <laughs> so um, there may be reasons, for, and this probably gets into the topic of forgiveness. All right. When people are wronged, um, um, they have the option of forgiving the, to whom they've been wronged. They are victims but they don't have to act like victims. At the same time, they need the respect um, that you have been wronged, you make the decision of forgiveness. Um, and the idea of forgiveness is a personal one. People Now we're getting into the faith realm. Many people of faith um, are, show have that reservoir within them to show grace. And I always come, the, I think the first time I ever official uh, wrote about grace was I store the story of the, um, uh, yes, another shooting, uh, but this was in 2004, where a gunman went into a, a Amish school and uh, slaughtered uh, uh, a number of children. He also then killed himself. The That evening, relatives of those girls who were lost uh, either approached or made it known that they forgave the the shooter and they wanted their family to know that they bore them no malice. We saw that to a degree in um, Charleston, the racist killing in the church. Um, where does that come from? Uh, uh, that is uh, an unknown spirit. I mean, a, a power. Um, but at the same time, and this is, gets into the idea of Me Too movement and sexual assault. Uh, and women are told, well, just forgive this. No, you make the choice. Now, the, per the reason for forgiveness means you can basically rid that person of eroding your dignity, yourself. But that's your choice. And so this is where grace is involved. Let's show grace to the victim. Let him or her make the decision to their next step. They have been wrong. They needed, they need to be treated with grace. 
And it's 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 an <clears throat> it's a moralistic question. It's a debatable question. There's no easy answer, um, but it, it gets to the answer of forgiveness. And when there's an absence of forgiveness, maybe there's an absence of grace. I don't know, but I I'm not going to say that's that's an individual thing. <clears throat> and grace may be working within that person. They're doing the best they can. Bless them. Let's move forward. Thank you, John. Uh, so Chip has a fun question for you here. And uh, he had put in the chat before that I missed mentioning in your bio that you're also an amazing piano player. Um, <laughs> so Chip says you use a variety of aesthetic forms in your work. So you use cartoons, poems, music, and you play the piano. So is there some relationship between artistic expressions and the subject of your book? Uh, bless uh, Chip. Chip also plays piano and organ, and he sings and he writes his own songs. So I think we I'm, should bring him over. <laughs> he's a wonderful role model. So thank you, Chip. Yeah, I think there is a way that um, music communicates us, uh, communicates to us on a different plane. It speaks directly to our souls. You know, there's a saying in country music. I think it was from Har um, Howard Harlan once said. Three chords and the truth, and it just zings in there and gets you. That's what music does, be it an opera or be it um, a, a Hank Williams ballad. It just touches you in a certain way, and all music does that. So, And poetry, too, is often the same way. Poetry is maybe you, words put to music, even if you lack the ability to rhyme, which I do, uh, so because it's 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 thought, it's process, it's it's just connecting your ideas in a different way, um, and so yeah, I think that's the, there is that something special about it. Um, anyway, that's fine. So here's a note from Howard, and I, I think I noticed this uh, because I'm following Howard on LinkedIn, that he saw the mass shooting in the Highland Park 4th of July parade, where people were doing all they could to share grace and, uh, or what he calls make someone's day at a time when they would be understood to focus only on themselves. And what an incredible experience you had, Howard, to watch that tragedy. Talking about firsthand. musicians, How Howard is a musician. He's a tuba player and he was in a klezmer band uh in that parade um and his book which i highly recommend make someone's day is really all about grace um and that's the day-to-day -day transactional way of showing intended acts of kindness yeah that's amazing um so we do have time for a few additional questions from john if anyone wants to put those in the chat um and I'm curious, John, uh, back to the question that Cynthia had asked about forgiveness, um, what you think about uh, what whether grace is possible when there's a toxic culture in an organization. So how could grace enable you to overcome a toxic culture? Well, it's kind of like that. What the serenity prayer, I will do what I can within the environment. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of toxic environments and they're, they erode people. Um, and they, in, uh, I think the easy thing to say is don't let it get to you. Well, that's easy because I'm not living through it, but, and that's where great, this comes where you show grace. I, okay, my community, my, my workplace is toxic, but I'm not going to act in a toxic manner. I will be kind. I will be considerate to my colleagues and those whom I have influenced over and with. So I will not model that toxic behavior. I will be the best I can be. I have a little saying that I used and, and I um, focus on better. And you define what better means, a better spouse, a better friend, a better colleague. And you do it with the recognition that um, I'll just try to get through the day, through the month, through whatever it is, and try to make things better for others. That's how to deal with it. Very, very easy to say. And the, 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 and this is where self-care comes in. Um, if you're in that toxic environment, um, uh, don't take it, uh, don't let it erode your self-esteem. A way of doing that, perhaps if you have the opportunity to, uh, quote, live a life outside of work, 
um, with your family, of course, uh, with your community. Um, know that the enrichment um, that you find from them, that's, the, that's a great um, antidote, shall we say, to a toxic culture, which is really soul destroying. So I, I have great sympathy for that. It's not, it's not easy. So yeah, here's a note uh, from Robert Peters. He says, grace and forgiveness are not a natural human response. They're supernatural and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't want grace and forgiveness? So thinking about it from that perspective, what would I want in the situation can help us extend grace and forgiveness when we don't feel like it. Good thought. Yeah, really, really good thought from you, uh, Robert. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, once again, I would love to share with you all some ways that you can stay connected to the wonderful work that John has put into his latest book, Grace Under Pressure. I mentioned it's the third book in his Grace trilogy. Um, we would encourage you to take a look at the retailer links that Kira, my chat host for the day, is putting into the chat so that you can pre-order Grace Under Pressure for yourself, your team or a friend or colleague. And when you do that, you'll get the opportunity to access some uh, special bulk buy offers that John has, which can get you access to his handbook online course. Um, again, John is offering uh, a very grace uh, giving option of a free 20 minute coaching call. And we would encourage you to check out John for coaching and speaking. Um, and as I mentioned, the book is coming next month um, from Post Hill Press, and we're, we're all excited to see it uh, get out into the world. One more last thing John mentioned to me as we were prepping for today's event that he actually has a LinkedIn Live interview. Uh, his show is called Grace Under Pressure, and he has an interview scheduled this afternoon. So if you'd like more learning with John and his special guest today, we would encourage you to check out the link that Kira is putting in the chat so that you can join him for that LinkedIn Live show. Over 200 shows and counting, John. That's pretty amazing. Well, it's it, it's been it's been fun, and it's um, I'm the beneficiary because I've gotten to speak to a lot of great thought leaders and doers who are making a positive difference in our in our life. Um, and I've spoken to academics, business leaders, authors. Um, uh, music people, uh, Chip Bell has been a, a guest, Howard has been a guest. So, uh, the best of the best have been on well, my show. I'm the beneficiary because I've learned from them. So, yes, um, and you've been a guest too. I and have a great book, Reach, which I highly recommend. Well, so. thank you. That's that's super kind. So, uh, John, I think that you have a story or some inspiration, uh, for us as we wrap up this time of learning together. A story about grace. <laughs> so, I think great. Well, people ask me about um, grace and where is it and where do you find it? And you know what? It's as simple as looking out the window. So, okay, that's being flippant. But we see grace in nature. Uh, we see it in a blue sky. We see it. People ask me, where is grace? And I say, look to your communities. The people who are involved with youth activities, teachers, first responders, people who treat uh, others with kindness. You know, I have the the privilege of uh, playing piano in a in a lobby of uh, area hospital here, and uh, I'm the headliner. I will you uh, want you to know that big name in lights because I'm the only one there. Every time I'm in there, people. Um, uh, I see examples of grace. I see staff. I see nurses treating both patients with kindness and consideration, but also their families. Um, you know, unless you work in a hospital, you don't want to be there. And that's why I'm there, because I'm playing piano, and that takes the edge off for some people. And I get great uh, um, um, thrill from that because... Uh, people show me appreciation. Just the other day, someone tipped me $40. And I, I said, I'm not supposed to take this. But then I thought to myself, if they felt good in giving me that tip, then bless them and I'll take it. And I donated it to charity, by the way. But anyway, grace is all around us. And um, when we show grace to others, it comes back to us. You know, you could call, call it karma. You know, and what you give, you will get back in, in more. So that's grace is all around us. 
Thank you, John.